Chapter Two of Against the Grain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen. Against the Grain by Joris Karl Wiesmans. Translated by John Howard. Chapter Two. More than two months passed before Des Essaintes could bury himself in the silent repose of his Fontenay abode. He was obliged to go to Paris again to comb the city in his search for the things he wanted to buy. What care he took, what meditations he surrendered himself to, before turning over his house to the upholsterers. He had long been a connoisseur in the sincerities and evasions of colour tones. In the days when he had entertained women at his home, he had created a boudoir where, amid daintily carved furniture of pale Japanese camphor wood, under a sort of pavilion of Indian rose-tinted satin, the flesh would colour delicately in the borrowed lights of the silken hangings. This room, each of whose sides was lined with mirrors that echoed each other all along the walls, reflecting as far as the eye could reach whole series of rose boudoirs, had been celebrated among the women who loved to immerse their nudity in this bath of warm carnation made fragrant with the odour of mint emanating from the exotic wood of the furniture. Aside from the sensual delights for which he had designed this chamber, this painted atmosphere, which gave new colour to faces grown dull and withered by the use of ceruse and by nights of dissipation, there were other more personal and perverse pleasures which he enjoyed in these languorous surroundings, pleasures which in some way stimulated memories of his past pains and dead ennuis. As a souvenir of the hated days of his childhood, he had suspended from the ceiling a small silver-wired cage where a captive cricket sang as if in the ashes of the chimneys of the Chateau de Lourdes. Listening to the sound he had so often heard before, he lived over again the silent evenings spent near his mother, the wretchedness of his suffering repressed youth, and then, while he yielded to the voluptuousness of the woman he mechanically caressed, whose words or laughter tore him from his reverie and rudely recalled him to the moment, to the boudoir, to reality. A tumult arose in his soul, a need of avenging the sad years he had endured, a mad wish to sully the recollections of his family by shameful action, a furious desire to pant on cushions of flesh to drain to their last dregs the most violent of carnal vices. On rainy autumnal days, when melancholy oppressed him, when a hatred of his home, the muddy yellow skies, the macadam clouds assailed him, he took refuge in this retreat set the cage lightly in motion, and watched it endlessly reflected in the play of the mirrors, until it seemed to his dazed eyes that the cage no longer stirred, but that the boudoir reeled and turned, filling the house with a rose-coloured waltz. In the days when he had deemed it necessary to affect singularity, des Essaintes had designed marvellously strange furnishings, dividing his salon into a series of alcoves hung with varied tapestries, to relate, by a subtle analogy, by a vague harmony of joyous or sombre, 
delicate or barbaric colours to the character of the Latin or French books he loved, and he would seclude himself in turn in the particular recess whose decor seemed best to correspond with the very essence of the work his caprice of the moment induced him to read. He had constructed, too, a lofty high room intended for the reception of his tradesmen. Here they were ushered in, and seated alongside each other in church pews, while from a pulpit he preached to them a sermon on dandyism, adjuring his bootmakers and tailors implicitly to obey his briefs in the matters of style threatening them with pecuniary excommunication if they failed to follow to the letter the instructions contained in his monitories and bulls. He acquired the reputation of an eccentric, which he enhanced by wearing costumes of white velvet and gold-embroidered waistcoats, by inserting in place of a cravat a palmer bouquet in the opening of his shirt, by giving famous dinners to men of letters, one of which, a revival of the eighteenth century, celebrating the most futile of his misadventures, was a funeral repast. In the dining-room, hung in black and opening on the transformed garden with its ash-powdered walks, its little pool now bordered with basalt and filled with ink, its clumps of cypresses and pines. The dinner had been served on a table draped in black, adorned with baskets of violets and scabiouses, lit by candelabra from which green flames blazed, and by chandeliers from which wax tapers flared. To the sound of funeral marches played by a concealed orchestra, nude negresses wearing slippers and stockings of silver cloth with patterns of tears served the guests. Out of black-edged plates they had drunk turtle soup and eaten Russian rye bread, ripe Turkish olives, caviar, smoked Frankfurt black pudding, game with sauces that were the colour of licorice and blacking, truffle gravy, chocolate cream, puddings, nectarines, grape preserves, mulberries and black-heart cherries. They had sipped out of dark glasses wines from Limagne, Roussillon, Tenedos, Val de Peños, and Porto, and after the coffee and walnut brandy had partaken of kvass and porter and stout. The farewell dinner to a temporarily dead virility. This was what he had written on invitation cards designed like bereavement notices. But he was done with those extravagances in which he had once gloried. Today he was filled with a contempt for those juvenile displays, the singular apparel, the appointments of his bizarre chambers. He contented himself with planning for his own pleasure, and no longer for the astonishment of others, an interior that should be comfortable, although embellished in a rare style, with building a curious calm retreat to serve the needs of his future solitude. When the Fontenay house was in readiness, fitted up by an architect according to his plans, when all that remained was to determine the colour scheme, he again devoted himself to long speculations. He desired colours whose expressiveness would be displayed in the artificial light of lamps. To him it mattered not at all if they were lifeless or crude in daylight, for it was at night that he lived, feeling more completely alone then feeling that only under the protective covering of darkness did the mind grow really animated and active. 
he also experienced a peculiar pleasure in being in a richly illuminated room the only patch of light amid the shadow-haunted sleeping houses this was a form of enjoyment in which perhaps entered an element of vanity that peculiar pleasure known to late workers when drawing aside the window curtains they perceive that everything about them is extinguished silent dead slowly one by one he selected the colours blue inclines to a false green by candlelight if it is dark like cobalt or indigo it turns black if it is bright it turns grey if it is soft like turquoise it grows feeble and faded there could be no question of making it the dominant note of a room unless it were blended with some other colour iron grey always frowns and is heavy pearl grey loses its blue and changes to a muddy white brown is lifeless and cold as for deep green such as emperor or myrtle it has the same properties as blue and merges into black there remained then the paler greens such as peacock cinnabar or lacquer but the light banishes their blues and brings out their yellows in tones that have a false and undecided quality no need to waste thought on the salmon the maize and rose colours whose feminine associations oppose all ideas of isolation no need to consider the violet which is completely neutralized at night only the red in it holds its ground and what a red a viscous red like the lees of wine besides it seemed useless to employ this colour for by using a certain amount of santonin he could get an effect of violet on his hangings these colours disposed of only three remained red orange yellow of these he preferred orange thus by his own example confirming the truth of a theory which he declared had almost mathematical correctness the theory that a harmony exists between the sensual nature of a truly artistic individual and the colour which most vividly impresses him disregarding entirely the generality of men whose gross retinas are capable of perceiving neither the cadence peculiar to each colour nor the mysterious charm of their nuances of light and shade ignoring the bourgeoisie whose eyes are insensible to the pomp and splendour of strong vibrant tones and devoting himself only to people with sensitive pupils refined by literature and art he was convinced that the eyes of those among them who dream of the ideal and demand illusions are generally caressed by blue and its derivatives mauve lilac and pearl grey provided always that these colours remain soft and do not overstep the bounds where they lose their personalities by being transformed into pure violets and frank greys those persons on the contrary who are energetic and incisive the plethoric red-blooded strong males who fling themselves unthinkingly into the affair of the moment generally delight in the bold gleams of yellows and reds the clashing symbols of vermilions and chromes that blind and intoxicate them but the eyes of enfeebled and nervous persons whose sensual appetites craved highly seasoned foods the eyes of hectic and over-excited creatures 
have a predilection towards that irritating and morbid colour with its fictitious splendours its acid fevers orange thus there could be no question about des Esseintes' choice but unquestionable difficulties still arose if red and yellow are heightened by light the same does not always hold true of their compound orange which often seems to ignite and turns to nasturtium to a flaming red he studied all their nuances by candlelight discovering a shade which it seemed to him would not lose its dominant tone but would stand every test required of it these preliminaries completed he sought to refrain from using for his study at least oriental stuffs and rugs which have become cheapened and ordinary now that rich merchants can easily pick them up at auctions and shops he finally decided to bind his walls like books with coarse-grained morocco with cape skin polished by strong steel plates under a powerful press when the wainscoting was finished he had the moulding and high plinths painted in indigo a lacquered indigo like that which coachmakers employ for carriage panels the ceiling slightly rounded was also lined with morocco in the centre was a wide opening resembling an immense bull's eye encased in orange skin a circle of the firmament worked out on a background of king blue silk on which were woven silver seraphim with outstretched wings this material had long before been embroidered by the cologne guild of weavers for an old cope the setting was complete at night the room subsided into a restful soothing harmony the wainscoting preserved its blue which seemed sustained and warmed by the orange and the orange remained pure strengthened and fanned as it was by the insistent breath of the blues des Esseintes was not deeply concerned about the furniture itself the only luxuries in the room were books and rare flowers he limited himself to these things intending later on to hang a few drawings or paintings on the panels which remained bare to place shelves and book-racks of ebony around the walls to spread the pelts of wild beasts and the skins of blue fox on the floor to install near a massive fifteenth-century counting-table deep arm-chairs and an old chapel reading-desk of forged iron one of those old lecterns on which the deacon formerly placed the antiphonary and which now supported one of the heavy folios of Ducange's Glossarium Mediae et Infimae Latinitatis. The windows, whose blue fissured panes, stippled with fragments of gold-edged bottles, intercepted the view of the country and only permitted a faint light to enter, were draped with curtains cut from old stoles of dark and reddish gold neutralized by an almost dead russet woven in the pattern the mantel-shelf was sumptuously draped with the remnant of a florentine dalmatica between two gilded copper monstrances of byzantine style originally brought from the old abbe au bois de bievre stood a marvellous church cannon divided into three separate compartments delicately wrought like lace-work it contained under its glass frame three works of baudelaire copied on real vellum with wonderful missal letters and splendid colouring to the right and left 
the sonnets bearing the titles of la mort des amants and l'ennemi in the centre the prose poem entitled anywhere out of the world n'importe où hors du monde end of chapter two recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey